<clears throat> Sometimes square root functions don't have x-intercepts. Why would they not have x-intercepts? Does anybody remember those graphs that we did? Sometimes we shifted them and moved them. But what was different about a square root function as opposed to a polynomial function or a rational function? What was different about its graph? <clears throat> Kind of appeared out of nowhere, right? Okay, it, it has that, it always has a restricted domain. Some of these other functions didn't necessarily have a restricted domain, or <clears throat> if their domain was restricted, it was just excluding one or two values, like with our rational functions. But with radical functions, our domain was always x is greater than or equal to something. Okay, so it was not defined until a particular x value. So a lot of times, actually, um, they, these graphs, these functions, these radical functions don't cross the x-axis or don't even touch the x-axis. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> they don't touch or they don't cross the x-axis. <coughs> Because they, they would either look something, they would start at a point right here and increase, or we also had the decreasing ones, um, but sometimes they would never equal zero. It is possible that they don't equal zero. Um, so let's look at an example using the same mentality that we have been using to solve for the x-intercept. Okay, we set the function equal to zero. So if we set number 25 equal to zero, and we're gonna try and solve this for x, y'all remember solving these equations? Okay, I hope so. We gotta get the square root by itself to start with, so we need to move that two that's there on the end. Now tell me this, before we continue on, is that possible right there? Can a square root equal a negative number? No. Well, okay. And this is where we have to be careful. Yes, when we take the square root, when we're solving the equation, we do include positive and a negative. But when we're talking about this having to be a function, you have to either consider positive x values or, or positive y values or negative y values because otherwise um, it won't be a function. If we include the positive and the negative, it's not going to cross, it's not going to pass the vertical line test. Okay, so when we're talking about um, this square root of x minus 2 being a function, it can only equal positive values. Now, if you don't catch that, if you proceed to solve this um, by squaring both sides, that would be the next step because it is a a square root, to undo a square root, you square both sides. So negative 2 squared is positive 4. The square root's gone on the right side. And then we want to add 2 to both sides, so we get 6 is equal to x. Now this is what my note's about up here. After you solve for x, check to make sure it equals 0. Plug it back in. If we plug 6 back into this equation right here, what do we get out? 6 minus 2 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. It's not 0. We want that to be 0 because we just said 6 was our x-intercept. X-intercepts, their y values are supposed to be 0. This one gives us 4. <clears throat> so this is not our x-intercept, okay? Now, the point 6, 4 is on the graph. 6, 4 is on the graph of this function, but the y value is 4. It's not the x-intercept, okay? So this one has no x-intercept, bless you. Let's see if it has a y-intercept, okay? So when we were solving these y-intercepts, what did we do to find y-intercepts? Every time, every function, plug in 0 for x, 
If we plug in zero for x here and we try to find out what we're getting for y, uh, what's the problem? You can't take the square root of negative 2. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. You can't take the square root of negative 2. So this one has no y-intercept either. <clears throat> if you graphed this when you were doing the domain and range and stuff, you should have noticed, um, just really quickly, I'm going to sketch this based on translations. This minus 2 on the inside shifts us right to, so where we normally start at the origin, we're going to go right to, and then the plus 2 on the end shifts us up to. So this is where our square root function is starting. This is what it looks like. It's never going to cross the x nor the y-axis. Okay, so we can have any combination here with radical, with square root functions, excuse me, more specifically square root functions. Um, you can have neither one, no x-intercept, no y-intercept. You can have one x-intercept or one y-intercept or theoretically you could have both. Okay, you could have both. Um, but a lot of times it's missing one or the other if not missing both of them. Okay, now the other type of radical functions that we've been looking at are our cube root functions. Now cube root functions will always have an x-intercept. And they will also always have a y-intercept. There aren't any issues there because it's a cube root. Cube roots, you can take cube roots of negative numbers. You can get negative answers for cube roots. Um, so we will have both of those regardless of what the function is doing. Okay, so let's find the y, or excuse me, the x-intercept first of number 29. Set it equal to zero and solve for x. So we need to start by adding that 1. How do we get rid of a cube root? You cube it. So positive 1 cubed is positive 1. That's equal to 27x, so last step we divide by 27. So our x-intercept is 1 over 27 zero. Yes, I want that in fractional form. Okay. If you type this in the, in, into your y equals, yes, you could use the zero function to find it, but I don't want the decimal. Okay. I want to see that you understand what an x-intercept is and that you can solve for it by hand. And then the y-intercept, okay, just like with all the other functions, we want to plug in zero for x. Well, that's nice because 27 times 0 is 0. The cube root of 0 is 0. So that says our y-intercept is <clears throat> negative 1. So our y-intercept in point form, the x is 0, the y is negative 1. 